Uh, welcome to Sudbury Canada Days. This is the 15th annual Can uh, Sudbury Canada Days, 1994. Uh, today has uh, been pretty kind to us so far, no rain, and we're thankful for that. We're hoping to see a little sun. Quite a lot going on this year at the, uh, at the events, and as you can see, as we pan around the, the area, there is a Civil War encampment set up on the Moses Mason lawn, and this is uh, the 4th Regiment Maine Volunteers, 1861 to 1865, and they are reenacting uh, what a Civil War camp would look like back during the Civil War days. So we'll be uh, taking a look through this event. There are many other events as well. Uh, we'll have uh, the volleyball tournament, which is traditional, the croquet tournament. There's a flower show, children's games, crafts, and uh, a little bit later, there will be the children's parade. Uh, and the, this year's theme is old time circus characters. So we'll be looking forward to filming some of that as well. Uh, we'll take a walk through the camp and, and try and take a look at, see what's there. Uh, people are milling about as, it, as we speak, and it should be quite interesting. We have any special events, uh, oral historians come in and uh, all of that. Plus we have a local TV station, which is Channel 4, public access TV, and this could be shown to them, you know, so the town of Bethel can see what's going on. Uh, so it's one way we try and keep the history of, of Bethel alive in this town. And, uh, it's been really, it's been good. Yeah, it's been... Uh, very effective. A lot of people like to watch the, you know, the shows that, that, that go on. And this is a real special one. And you know, of course, with this kind of a living museum out here, it's great. But so this is a typical camp. Well, it's not quite typical because we have some displays set up, which on a normal camp you wouldn't have that. We're here to show and tell. Right. So it's a little of both. Um, you kind of set uh, up. Normally, what I would have, I'd be set up near the blacksmith shop, and anybody that had problem with guns and stuff, you'd probably see kegs of powder. You'd probably see cases of guns, cases of gunpowder, you know, stuff like that piled up in tents. Right. And you'd probably see the quartermaster right close by, and he's got some of the oddment stuff that you might see down at the quartermaster tent. And this is more. Oh. Uh, we're part of a regiment. Mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're the suppliers for the regiment. And you'll see probably some of the private soldiers. You'll also see the surgeon. Um, yeah, my children already told me I got to go check that out with the surgeon but equipment. We're kind of missing about, you know, a thousand men. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To a thousand men. So this is just a small part of it. And I noticed we just get cut off there, but I think our battery ran down a little bit low. We'll continue walking through the camp and try and take a look. The surgeon had just shown up at the uh, at the sergeant's bunkhouse, and as you can kind of see inside the tent, um, they are a little different in each one. Fairly narrow bed in this particular tent, and uh, move down. We'll see different functions for different places. This is the uh, the quartermaster area, and looks like a, quite a nice setup. You can see the cannonballs on the side and different uh, barrels and kegs filled with equipment. The sign over here says Camp Knox, 4th Maine Regiment Volunteers. And as I was talking with the, uh, the sergeant over there, he said there were some times when uh, the men would be able to bring their wives, especially if you had the, uh, the post of a sergeant, you might be able to bring more equipment. And some of these tents are uh, involved with craft works and, and the makings of things. I would, I would say that this small tent here might be belonging to just uh, a private, somebody with not a very high rank. And it's just a pretty much makeshift arrangement. Not much in the way of furniture. 
in this area. Hi. Hello. We're going through, we're filming a little of this for the Bethel Historical Society, and we put it on Channel 4. And, um, you do this often, this kind of a weekend oh, yeah, activity throughout the summer? And you just came back. I just came back from uh, Fort Warren in Boston Harbor. It's on Georgia's Island. Right, yeah. Um, and we did an event last, last weekend. My brother, who's a surgeon, and myself. Uh-huh. Um, and your son. And my son, yeah. So the whole family gets involved with yeah. this. Yeah. Great. My sister-in-law wasn't able to do it, but we went, all of us. Yep. You can uh, go there, as often you, as you want. <laughs> if you um, would like to take a look, those are two original dresses. Wow, we'll take a look inside. And there's some children's clothing. Children's clothing. Yeah, inside the tent. So this would be kind of a typical size of a tent um, for... This is probably would be uh, an officer's tent. Um, I'm lucky I have this. This is very, very comfortable. Um, Looks nice. And those are some original uh, clothing in there. The, the one way, way back, the black dress is a mourning dress. A uh, lady would wear that if she lost a, a relative, a husband or son or, or father. Um, and they would be in mourning for at least a year, minimum, and they would wear all black. They would wear the black for the entire year? Yes, for the entire year. The front dress is just a day dress, and those are original people really did wear that and then way back on the little box back there is some children's clothing yeah for a small child now i was talking with the the sergeant uh over there and he said that uh, sometimes wives could come along yeah. right. um with the troops. usually officers wives right and they would um come along and and be seamstresses um they would um do washing. Um, they would do a lot of different things for the soldiers. They had a couple of societies. One was um, the, the um, Christian Commission, and there would be people, ladies that are Christians, and they would bring Bibles to the troops. Um, they would bring all kinds of different things that they needed, knit socks, um, make uh, undergarments, shirts, um, different things like that. And then there was a sanitary commission, and they also would go to the different camps and try to make things as sanitary as they possibly could, which in many cases was very difficult. They didn't have a lot to deal with. The North was a lot better off than the Southern troops. Um, they were much better taken care of, um, even though most of the time they weren't in real good condition, but they were better off than the, than the other the, the southern camps would not have some of the amenities that the northern they camps had. They, they didn't have food many times. Um, the food was bad. Um, they didn't have shoes or, or all many things. They were very, very poor. And there was a big blockade um, right. that um, made it very difficult for them. For to them to get any supplies. And the north were the manufacturers, and they were the ones that were going to be able to send you those things. So that must have been difficult. Now, what would the um, the regular soldier? What kind of sleeping conditions would they have? He would. We don't have any regular soldiers' uh, tents here. They would be little, small tents, and they would have two people in that tent. And the tents were get come in two halves, and each soldier would take one half of the tent. And they had no front, no back, and they would put up just by poles, three poles. And oftentimes they didn't carry the poles. They'd just take a tree, cut it down, and, and fashion the poles and two of them would sleep in there on the ground, um, most of the soldiers. If it was a, a winter camp, they would have these. If it was a, a stationary camp, they would have these. Um, we've seen pictures with, with rows and rows and rows of these aid tents. And there'd probably be about five or six soldiers sleep in there. I have very luxurious accommodations. Very and luxurious. That, yeah. And, and what would the rank be of your husband? Well, most likely he would be um, an upper rank, maybe a um, captain. captain or, you know, upper upper ranks. It wouldn't be the lower rank soldiers. Well, thank you very much, and uh, that's been very helpful. What is your name? My name is Donna Porter. Donna, mm -hmm. thank you very much. And your name? Linda Holcomb. Linda, nice to have met you. Thanks.
we'll continue on. Let's go over to the surgeon and see how they're doing over here. Of course, during the Civil War, the surgeon would be a very important place and uh, very active, unfortunately. Some of the uh, things on the table are a little bit gory. Uh, they've done some things to recreate what you might find. Uh, you've got to remember that this is part of a an exhibit as well, so it might not look exactly like it is. Everything's nicely laid out, and uh, but we do have uh, somebody's finger in the uh, the pan over here that must have just been amputated off. I don't know if Justin can get it get on in on that, or if he even wants to. But um, I see a bottle of Bay Rum here that was probably used to uh, calm the soldier down who was having some surgery done. The, uh, the equipment is, looks original, and uh, I, I take a look over in the wood box just down the way there, and I see some saws, on, and uh, that must have been for the difficult job of amputation. Um, could not have been an easy position to be the surgeon during the, si the Civil War. As we look down into the tent area, you can see some of the medicines that they have. You don't? Okay. How you doing? Pretty good. We're uh, doing a little filming for the Historical Society, and uh, we, we try and put some of the things that we do here on Channel 4, which is a public access television station. So this is a great, great thing to be seen. And I think I was just talking to your wife over there about... No, that's my sister. Oh, your sister. Yeah. Okay, that, yeah, that's right. She yeah. said my that. My wife couldn't be here. She's disappointed that she couldn't be here. And you do this uh, quite often. Oh, this is a hobby. This yeah, is this is great. Yeah. Try to teach uh, Americans their history. It's a great way to do it. Um, well, I've learned a lot myself. I mean, you know, but it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, you'd be surprised at just how much people don't know about their own history. I mean, yeah. they've only got so much time in school that, you know, uh, they don't teach you the day-to-day -day things, you know, in school. You just get the names and the dates. And, right. And maybe a little bit of the politics, and that's about it. And this way, you know, we can teach people what life was day-to-day, -day, you know. And I think people find it more interesting because it brings it home to them. More, oh, yeah. You know, uh, history can be so dry uh, as to how it's presented, you know, uh, yet it can be a whole lot of fun, too. Yeah. You know? Well, we this tend to see history sometimes just in terms of battles and who won and who lost, who lost. but not in, in human suffering and human day to day living. And right. uh, so you set this up and you kind of get an idea. Yeah, I've already learned it, yeah. quite exactly. a bit about the conditions and. And what they had now is this all of your kind of this have you been collecting this? My wife's and mine, yeah. Either I've collected it or I've made it. Right. Yeah. Um, the uh, kits and stuff all over here on the table are original. Some of the pieces in here are original or I've or I've reproduced them. Uh, now do you have an interest in, in doctoring anyways or uh, is well I, I basically got involved in the reenacting part of the, the medical because my wife's a medical assistant and my sister's a nurse in 20th century and um, a few years ago I'd hurt myself and I wasn't really able to run around in the you know with a, with a rifleman anymore right. so I didn't want to leave reenacting and not too many people were doing the medical at that time weren't doing the medical, so I thought, well, heck, you know, it'd be a good shoe in Yep. So I started doing it, and it's grown to what, what it is today for me. And there's some other people out there doing it now that are doing as, as good a job or right. better. Yep. You know, it just depends on how much money you've got to throw around. <laughs> so it's quite active, and, and there's probably something going on almost every weekend as oh, far yeah, as a, you can go up an exhibit. The East Coast, I mean, just about any weekend you can find, yep. you know, things to do. We just had some folks up last weekend that we did uh, Fort Warren on George's Island in Boston Harbor. Right, yep. And a gentleman came up from Georgia. Yeah, so I do it. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold from last <laughs> weekend, so. Yep. Well, that's great. Um, did the surgeon have kind of a higher status than some others, or where did they stand in the ranking? Yeah, the surgeon, in terms, he was an officer. Right. 
So he was accorded all all uh, uh, respect that an officer would get. However, not too many people like the surgeon. Well, he didn't they, bring him a lot of good news most no, of the time. No, he didn't. And many cases that uh, you know they just were afraid to go because they knew that they would lose an arm or a yeah. leg. And that wasn't done because they didn't have the knowledge to save it. They didn't have the time to save it. So that was a real tragic kind of a situation where you're saying, if I had time, I could I save could this save guy, it. but save we don't have time. Save his arm or his leg. Right. If the bone was involved, the limb was gone. They Any kind of, yeah, they just didn't. They just didn't take the time. They could resect an arm. Okay, now it wasn't until the 1980s that they had the knowledge of microbiology. So the arm or the leg would have been just dead hanging there anyway, right. but at least they would have had it. Yep. But there were so many casualties, they didn't have time. Yep. Gettysburg, in three days of Gettysburg, you had 33% casualties. Now to put that in numbers, you had 180,000 troops engaged. 53,000 died. Unbelievable. Okay? And compare that to Vietnam, nine and a half years of war, you had 58,000 died. Right. <laughs> Three yeah. days to nine yeah, and a half years. That's year. unbelievable. I mean, when you think of it in terms, excuse me. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, you know how you, you said that you sit down and you said that your pipes are were crooked because it put war in? Yeah. Well, he, now I don't know if he can straighten them out. <coughs> right now, dear, I don't know where they are. I'll have to do it later, okay? And I guess this is the uh, area for the sick to yeah. come into, oh, and plus our, where you... I sleep in. It is. Now, would there be a tent for the yeah, injured? there would have been tents, hospital tents set up. And close to you? They would have been in the same er local area. Right. Okay. Uh, the actual hospital itself wouldn't have been in a company street like this. Right. Okay. The reason I am this weekend is... Just for the exhibit. Right, yeah. exactly. There would have been an area set aside for the hospital, and each regimental surgeon would have been sent to that area, much like it's done today. Right. Each organization in the military has their own cooks, their own doctors, their own whatevers, and they're all sent to these, you know, when, when they get in and they're going to be there for a while, they're sent to the hospital or they're sent to the mess hall or whatever, and they, you know, they work together. Um, now, would you have your wife here with you? Would a surgeon um, most likely be able I to bring was, their family? If I was going to be in the field following the troops under campaign, probably not. If we were going to be encamped in an area for, you know, maybe a matter of weeks or months, then yes, she, she would come and, and, and stay with me. Yeah. Being an officer, I could be accorded that. Right. When did uh, they first have quinine? Quinine came in the 1840s, I believe. I'm not quite sure on the exact date. Um, ether was around in the 18, late 1840s. 1847, I believe, is when it was discovered for um, uh, as an anesthesia. And it was discovered by Dennis Dog in Boston. What happened was they were using it for a laboratory stuff, okay? And the, the dentist stepped out, and the dog knocked it over, get into it. The dentist came back in and found his dog unconscious. Thought he was dead, went out to get a box, come back in to bury the dog, and here's the dog walking around. So he started knocking the dog out, bringing him to. And he realized that when the dog was out, I mean, he could poke him and do everything, nothing would happen. So he got the brilliant idea, I'm going to pull the dog's tooth. Knocked him back out, pulled his tooth. dog woke up, went over, and drank out of the bowl like nothing happened. Wow. <laughs> the rest is history. A lot of your older surgeons didn't like it. They called it, you know, um, uh, you know, devil medicine. Like anybody that's been in a trade or a profession for a long time, they don't like to see new things for some reason. I don't know why. It's, and I know in my profession, I've seen the same thing. Try to tell them the old saying: teach an old dog new tricks. Right. You know, they just. Uh, same with the battleships during the from the First World War to the Second World War. I mean, they believed in the old battleships when they came out with the aircraft carriers. The old admiral said, oh, those aren't going to be any good. Right. <laughs> so, you know, and it was always the same, but as it turned out, the ether was good. And then they used chloroform. In the field, they preferred the chloroform because most of the surgery in the field was only 15 minutes. And, that and chloroform... Uh, you can't use chloroform any more than 15 minutes or it becomes toxic to the liver. Right. <clears throat> you can't 
use it, I think it's three three to five days after it's been used, you can't use it again on the same person. So in the field, they preferred that because it was less volatile. Ether is highly volatile. When you got your cigar smoking surgeons or your gas lamps or whatnot, because mostly surgery was at night. And, uh, you know, your battles are fought during the day, so the wounded started coming in the late, you know, early evening and the late evening. And, and they would be, uh, after that, it would, they'd be going around the clock. But, you know, at night they'd have, they'd have the gas lamps or the, or the uh, candles going. And they didn't want to blow up. 53,000. 33%. <coughs> well, I had a family member at Gettysburg. He died the day after the battle. Yeah. After the battle was the third? Well, that was Pickett's charge. And the two armies just kind of sat there and looked at each other and forth. They were so tired. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold. Thank you very much for talking with us. Great. Let's go down and see what, what all that fireworks is about. <coughs> We've got somebody firing their gun. Well, we've got the blacksmith on the uh, doing an exhibition right now. We got quite a crowd here to watch. And we got some of the youngsters involved in stoking the fire. A lot of smoke. Of course, the blacksmith was very important to the military life, doing repairs and keeping the, the horses going and all sorts of uh, camp implements being made. He's got that fired up pretty good right now. It's like he could cook a uh, steak in about two minutes. Now, he's got it red hot, and he's going to fashion it with his hammer. And so I guess that process would continue until he gets it just the way he wants it. Well, we'll walk a little further down, see if we can... Uh, find that soldier with his gun. Now, we've got a soldier over here who's, I guess, been the guy that's been making all that noise. When you're, when you're firing this thing live, when you're down at the range, if it's a sunny day, you can see the bullet going through the air. It's just like a pellet gun or something like that. You can see it just cruising. You know, it's basically... I mean, I wouldn't want to be hit by the bullet. Uh, yep. So I guess he's been firing away here. He's going to get... Uh, He's going to show us exactly what they they fire. Yeah. That's the size of the bullet that went down the barrel of that. Thing. So it was a, like a, a low velocity but high. Low velocity, high but if you got hit, it's just like knock you down. Knock you. It's like anything, you know. They, that thing can. I mean, and this is about how heavy they are. Yeah. Or that's, that's a real bullet. That's, that's I could put this down this barrel and fire it right now. It's kind of illegal right now. <laughs> 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 right. Um, 
So that would account for all the amputations, yeah. because if you could clip with that. A modern day bullet will go right through the bone. This would hit and then smash from here to here, every single bone. You know, it would just... Plus with mushrooms as well, so probably be about that One of the... One of my friends was, uh, in fact he's here, was firing at a, you know, the 55 gallon burn well, barrels. Yep. Two shots ripped it in half. And you know, you know how big those are, you know. So two shots ripped it straight in half. And they, you know, they, it would put a hole in you probably. It'd probably go, it'd go in at this size and it'd probably come out with that size of a hole. And they, you know, they mushroomed out pretty good. Let me put things back over here. Wow, that's quite a quite a bullet. Okay, I guess we're going to get some noise now. So. Then after a while, the Confederates figured out well, let's hide in the bushes, <laughs> and then they, you know. Yeah. So that's just pulling, putting the powder in. That's just putting the powder in. I haven't put any powder, any bullet in. You know, probably the ramrod would come out that far if there was a bullet in. Right. This little pouch. Yeah. Or in the thing that you put over the. Uh, right there. Yeah. It's a nipple. Oh. And, they, and the spark and the cap would go down. And the powder right now is right here. Uh -huh. And it would go down into there. And the cap has like black powder coating? Well, what it is, I can't remember what it's. It's like that. And what's in, what's in just a thin coating of um, nitro lime or something? It's. Hold on, let me. Man, what's inside the cap? What's inside the cap? Mercury huh. would be in there. Yep, <laughs> cover your ears. Fire in the hole! That's a <laughs> I, I went down to Virginia and there was 7,000 guns going off. Plus, <laughs> plus, um, yeah. about 25, 30 cannons. And each cannon. A service charge was a pound for a three-inch ordnance rifle for a pound of gunpowder. The some of the really, really big cannons. There's one up at Fort Knox. Twenty-five pounds was his regular charge. They wanted the 20th Maine one to set that cannon off, but if they did, it would shatter every window in Bucksport. <laughs> Any questions? That's great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Over on the uh, east side of the Historical Society, we have some other crafts going on. There's some quilting being done over here, and there's a cider press, and people look like they're making that right now, as you can see it dripping into the bucket. And they've got some young, energetic people to uh, help with that, which is always a good trick to get them to do the work. There he goes. He got through it. Must be Timmy Brooks. Doing a good job. I'm sure Justin and I would like to have a little bit of cider after they're done. Yeah, that looks like fun. Over on the other side, they've got some spinning wheels and got some people dealing with uh, fabrics and let's see what they're doing over here. Got some wool to spin and some quite interesting machinery here. Some wool that's going to be spun. 
some different dyes. And so those are some of the activities that are going on uh, this morning and, and just into early afternoon. And in a little while, they'll be uh, coming up with the children's parade and some of the games, the volleyball and the croquet tournament. So uh, we'll be... What's your name? Henry. This is Henry, and Henry's a ringmaster. Very good, Henry. Henry, would you step over there? And we'll bring the strong man in. And your name is? George. George. Yeah, it's good to meet you, George, and you're the strong man. All right? Great. Strong man. And you are Sarah Gamble. And you are a fortune teller. Thank you very much, Sarah. Hello, John. And, and you're a horse tamer? Very good. Thank you, John. Ashley. Ashley Oliver. And you are? Uh, trapeze artist. Trapeze Thank you. Bones. Now, what's this? A, pa a package deal here? Yep. I'm Bozo. Bozo. And you're thinking, and a couple of clowns, you're really Caroline and Lauren, I think. Yes, thank you very much. And you, you are, you're Andrew, and what's in your hat? A rabbit, you pulled it out of your hat, very good. Thank you very much. And you're Lindsay, I recognize you. And what are you? I'm ballerina. You're a ballerina, you're very pretty too. Thanks very much. Hi, Kelsey. I'm a Rara Sistumba girl. You're a Rara Sistumba girl, all right. Jackie? Hi. And you are a clown. Extraordinary clown. Thank you. And your name is Mia. Nice to see you. And you are a clown. Right? A very good one. Thanks. And you, sir, Parker. And this is your lion, buddy. Thank you very much. And this is Dan, and that's Andy, and this is the ringmaster and his trained bear. Thanks very much, guys. And your name? Abby. Abby. And you, I think, are a clown. Are you a clown? You are a very nice clown. Thank you. And you are Fred. Fred is the bear trainer, and those are his bears. Great. Thank you very much. All right. So.
those are our contestants, and a little later we'll be giving out some ribbons and some prizes, but the judges have to go back and decide on all of these wonderful costumes. So, a little bit later. Go!
then jump all the way back up to the tree. Yeah! That sounds better to everybody. So, where the suitcases? Okay. Can, can we make a line of like the burlap bags or something so that they know where the house is? You mean the suitcase? Pop, pop up to the suitcase? Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our portion of the program. This is the Mahusik Music Makers Community Band. Uh, we rehearse twice a week, or have been for the past, what, two and a half months. This is our second concert. And um, we would invite anybody who plays an instrument to come join us. In fact, is there anybody out there who plays baritone horn, trumpet, or clarinet? 
I have some in the car, and I'd be happy to give it to you. You can join us right now. <laughs> That's sort of the flavor of the group that I'd like to uh, have you take with you. It's a fun group to play with. It's a group that gets together for the fun of music. Hopefully, we'll have a time when we will have some normal concerts indoors where we can have some fun and, and present some different kinds of music. We've been a little... Um, stilted in what kinds of music we could do by the amount of people that, that we'd have coming to rehearsals. I think we've had at most 18 at any one rehearsal. We've had as many as 30 people join us over the summer. Um, not all of those have been at concerts, but they've enjoyed the rehearsals. We hope that some of them will join us again in the fall. This will continue. We're hoping to have rehearsals once a week somewhere. We'll have it advertised, and if you're interested or know somebody who's interested, Please come right up and let me know or let them know and we'll try to make a connection. We also would like to dedicate our concert today in the memory of one of our members, Patty Knoll, who played our first concert with us and we miss her. Um, we would like to dedicate it because we want to remember her in every way we can. We only knew her a short time and we're hoping that our our band will continue in the spirit in which we felt her spirit. Um, she was very happy, very upbeat, uh, excited about the band, excited about playing or learning how to replay because most of us haven't played in 20 years. And so with that in mind, I'd like to dedicate the rest of our concert to her, her memory. And uh, please talk to us if you'd like to after the concert and we'll see where we can go. We'd like to start our concert off with the Olympic fanfare. You might recognize this from a couple years ago from the Olympic Summer Olympics, I think, had this. This is called the Olympic fanfare. <laughs>
be last, and blue is going to be first, and green would be the middle. So we go first, second, third. Okay? Do you guys know how to play? I don't know. Okay, well we can help I'm, you with any I'm, rules. I'm, I don't know that. Okay. 